You mean watch me mow the lawn? Oh, this is a hot job. Well, why don't you run, Daddy? Then you get finished quicker. Run? Dottie, why don't you go play with your dolls? Oh, gosh, I've got to take a minute off. What's the matter, Daddy? What'd you sit down for? Are you tired already? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Mowing a couple of acres of lawn is very relaxing. Oh. Daddy, what makes the grass grow? Well, it's a... Uh, uh, you see, uh, well, grass grows because... Uh, it, well, the same thing makes grass grow that makes you grow, Dottie. Do you know what makes you grow? Oh, sure. It's vegetables. Maybe we'll be able to give both Dottie and her perspiring pater familias a few bits of knowledge on the vegetable kingdom after we've completed uh, the excursion in science we're about to undertake. Our science reporter, Emerson Markham, recently interviewed Dr. Charles G. King, scientific director of the Nutrition Foundation Incorporated at New York City. Dr. King is the man who, in 1932, first isolated vitamin C. So we are about to be brought down to date with the latest chapters in the story of vitamin C. Lead on, Mr. Markham. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? Today, with American soldiers occupying isolated outposts or moving in streams of millions of men across oceans and deserts and ice fields and jungles, it's a good idea to look at some of the details that make such movements possible. Now, one of the major basic details is the food supply. And getting the right amount of food to the right place at the right time must be quite a job, to put it mildly. Oh, it is indeed. And to that sheer mechanical problem of getting enough of any kind of food to distant points must be added many extra problems that call for the best services that modern science and management can provide. What particular problems have you in mind? Well, first of all, each item must be kept attractive enough in flavor and in appearance so that men will eat it. And second, the food must retain every aspect of its nutritive quality so that the men will remain at their best levels of health and military efficiency. It must be a headache to keep the food from spoiling, let alone try to keep it attractive looking. Oh, that's just it. The basic planning for army rations is set to provide everything needed. But when there is no refrigeration in hot climates, it isn't long before such items as butter, powdered milk, flour, and prepared biscuits tend to become rancid. And even dehydrated fruits and vegetables gradually lose their color and their flavor. About that time, the soldier begins to throw away distasteful items, and his food supply becomes less than it should be, both in quality and in quantity. And then trouble sets in. Right. The soldier's fighting courage can offset such disadvantages to some degree, but missing a single meal or going short on rations for several meals in succession leaves the soldier below his best level of fighting ability. He is less accurate and has less endurance. And right about here is where vitamins come into the picture? Well, yes. Since the dawn of history, man has discovered over and over again that there is something in fresh foods that is necessary for the preservation of health and physical strength. Grains are good staple foods and contain liberal quantities of the B group of vitamins, but they have practically no vitamin C, a very sensitive factor in fresh foods, especially the fruits and vegetables. During the long military campaigns or ocean voyages, the disease called scurvy formerly intervened with the resulting weakness and swollen joints and hemorrhages and bleeding gums and finally complete collapse. An outbreak of that sort probably puts a serious crimp in military procedure. Yes, and some of the classical examples about which Dr. King told me where scurvy played a damaging role are probably well worth recalling. For example, Napoleon's disastrous campaign in Russia collapsed in part, at least, because his troops were weakened by the onset of scurvy. Columbus' voyage to America came very near to failure for the same reason. The early American colonists had to contend with scurvy repeatedly, but they finally learned from the native Indians that they could cure scurvy by drinking a fresh tea or a specially brewed beer made from evergreens, such as the spruce tree. In fact, it has been estimated that up to the time of World War I, more men had been lost at sea from scurvy than from all the losses in naval warfare. 
Well, that's amazing. And it would be depressing, too, if we didn't know that the great steps to overcome such conditions had been made. Yes, man has progressed. Dr. King told me that when Admiral Byrd made his last trip to the Antarctic, a small package of pure crystalline vitamin C gave his crew full assurance that there would be no scurvy. In contrast, on his earlier trip, nearly a carload of dehydrated lemon juice was needed to provide the one vitamin required for protection from scurvy. Quite a difference between one package and a carload. But what about vitamins in the Army, Emerson? Let's get back to them. In this war, Bob, the food officers know that if they have no other source of vitamin C, grains or beans can be sprouted for a few days, whereupon vitamin C is formed in generous quantity. In 1944, an American found that mung beans, when sprouted, stood out above all other seeds studied in their synthesis of vitamin. But right here we should chalk up another credit mark for the Chinese, too, because they have used sprouted mung beans for centuries without even knowing that vitamins existed. Just how long have we had vitamin C, Emerson? Vitamin C was isolated from lemon juice in 1932, so that chemists could study its properties as a pure crystalline substance. Within about two years, chemists learned how to make it from corn sugar, so that unlimited supplies can now be manufactured as needed. In normal civilian life, oranges, grapefruit, lemons, tomatoes, potatoes, and many other fresher canned foods can be relied upon to provide the vitamin. But in military life, where they oftentimes can't get these fresh sources of the vitamin, are they now using vitamin C in the pure form the way Admiral Byrd did? Yes, for military purposes. And whenever men are isolated from fresh food supplies, the synthetic product is very useful. The armed forces now use large quantities of the pure vitamin to blend with dried lemon flavored in sugar. And every soldier in the field can add a small packet of this powder to a cup of water and thus have a drink of lemonade with confidence that the vitamin is there. <laughs> the story goes, however, that some of the wax prefer to use the lemon powder to wash their hair. And they say an army marches on its stomach. But tell me, Emerson, uh, has vitamin C other uses besides being added to army rations and as a medicine to cure scurvy? Oh, yes, indeed. Knowing what the vitamin is, chemists and physicians can do lots of interesting things with it in addition to the uses I've already mentioned. For example, Dr. King told me that they can examine a drop of blood drawn from the tip of a finger, and by measuring the vitamin content, estimate whether the person has been eating enough vitamin C. Or they can test sprouting beans every uh, few hours to find when they reach their maximum vitamin content. Or they can examine fresh milk while it is being prepared for market and find what kind of equipment gives the best product. Now, pardon the interruption, Emerson. Uh, those are interesting examples, to be sure, but what does equipment have to do with the best milk product and vitamin C? Well, mere traces of copper from dairy equipment may cause the vitamin to be lost. In the case of milk, loss of retention of vitamin C provides a good index to retention of an acceptable flavor. And again, in the preparation of canned fruit juices and canned baby foods, the chemist can tell quickly which products will be best to use, and he can find out how to treat them on their way to market so that they will be of greatest value in protecting the health of the consumer. You know, I was just wondering, uh, should people be very concerned about having enough vitamin C? I mean, isn't it just one among many vitamins that every American eats regularly at mealtime? Now, that question is a valid one, but it is clear that when the intake of the vitamin is only enough to prevent scurvy, the body still may not be in its best condition. Poor tooth and bone development, weakened blood vessels, slow healing of wounds, and other impairments to health may follow long periods with a low vitamin C intake. We need much more information, however, concerning the effects of these borderline types of deficiencies, hence the practice of providing regularly for foods rich in vitamin C, such as citrus juices and melons, berries, bananas, and tomatoes. It's sound. It's good insurance. From what you've said, I take it that the story of vitamin C isn't complete down through the final chapter yet. <laughs> no, Bob, it is not. And meanwhile, chemists would like to know more about how the vitamin functions inside the body. A pound of pure crystals, if taken in small regular dosages, would last a person half a lifetime. Dr. King says it must be doing many interesting things inside our bodies, but the picture of its work there is still very incomplete. wonder how long it'll be before they find out all about it. Well, it took four years of continuous work by graduate students at the University of Pittsburgh to isolate the pure substance from lemon juice. And that was a much simpler task than finding 
what it does inside a live guinea pig or a growing plant or a human body. Dr. King says he believes our children and our grandchildren will have plenty of interesting things to work on and things that will make for better health. Vitamin C is only one of 40 or more individual items now recognized as necessary to man's food supply. From the research man's point of view, the story of each is now only a beginning. And we're grateful to you and Dr. King for keeping us abreast of developments so far. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to have a copy of a scientific paper prepared by Dr. C.G. King, Scientific Director of the Nutrition Foundation, Incorporated, all you have to do to get your copy is address your request to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for Scientific Paper Number 184, The Story of Vitamin C. That's Scientific Paper Number 184, The Story of Vitamin C. And now, ladies and gentlemen, question and answer time is upon us once more. The questions have been sent in by you listeners. The answers are as scientifically sound as can be obtained since they are based on information provided by staff members of the General Electric Research Laboratory or of other equally reliable sources. Now, here's the first one, Emerson. It comes from a friend who would like to know how the mosquito and the fly can thrive when man is not available to attack. It seems he has had some annoying experiences with these insects during the spring and early summer when fishing. He wonders if these insects live only a brief time and die of malnutrition, in the meantime hatching out in great numbers so there's always a plentiful supply of them. Well, I asked several authorities about that, Bob. Probably the best answer we could give to this question is the one Dr. E.F. Phillips of the Department of Entomology at Cornell University gave me. First of all, Dr. Phillips pointed out that there are many species of mosquitoes and many other flies. What do you mean, other flies? Well, mosquitoes, like flies, also have uh, two wings, which places them among the flies. Now, neither the mosquito nor the fly is dependent on biting man to thrive. And as Dr. Phillips added, we might say that their purpose is not to annoy mankind. In fact, they get along all right without a visit from man. Some species just take it upon themselves to worry man when he invades their neighborhood. Man, you see, is no more to them than any other of the animal associates, except, of course, as he may have it in his power to reduce their numbers by the use of man-made equipment. And then what is the diet of the mosquito, for instance? <laughs> well, that's quite a question to answer completely. Entire books have been written on this one subject alone. Well, putting it another way, what sort of thing do they eat? We can summarize by saying that taking the species as a whole, they live on living as well as decaying vegetable and animal material. And you could find many species of mosquitoes to use each of these vast categories of materials. And then, too, a considerable number specialize on such foods as the nectar or the pollen of flowers. Plenty of them do utilize the blood of various animal species. Insects will eat anything, Dr. Phillips said, when you consider the whole gang but each specializes on a special class, with the rare exception of those that would use almost anything with food value. The next listener asks, what happens to microscopic organisms present in water when the water is evaporated? As a rule, the organisms die. That is, they dry up with the water. Sometimes they are carried away with the wind like dust particles, and other times they stay put. They may become a part of dust, or dust consists of moles and spores and other fine dry particles in addition to earthy matter. What are the tiny organisms, Emerson? They may belong to either the plant kingdom or to the animal kingdom, Bob. In general, people refer to all microscopic forms of life as microbes and to pathogenic microbes or those which cause disease as, as germs. Now, in the field of science, microorganisms in the plant kingdom are known as bacteria and those in the animal kingdom as protozoa. Now for this next one. The gentleman writes, I would like to know how scientists explain the fact that the Earth is round or nearly so, and yet everyone is right side up, regardless of his or her position on the Earth. <laughs> well, the reason is that we and all other objects are held to the surface of the Earth by gravity, the force of which is exerted along a line from the center of the Earth to the object. Thus, when a man rises to his feet against the force of gravity, his body assumes a position on that line. That is, perpendicular to the surface of the earth at that place. Now, the same is true of all other people around him, and as far as he can see, 
so was they all look right side up to him. Is that true both for a man in the United States and, say, a man in Australia? Oh, yes, Bob. Everything looks right side up to each of them. But if they could see each other through the earth, each would then look upside down to the other. Well, we'll look definitely out of place, if not upside down, to somebody if we don't make our departure when we're supposed to. So I'll just say thank you, Emerson Markham, and goodbye, everyone, until our next excursion in science.